Hello, and welcome to episode 6 of our open online course for Einstein Summation Convention. In the last episode, we looked into the Kronecker Delta Tensor and the properties that make it useful in Einstein Summation Convention. Today, we'll have a look at another special tensor, the Epsilon symbol. The Epsilon symbol looks like this, this squiggly E, I, J, K. For this course, we will be looking expressly at the third order Epsilon tensor, but do be warned, variants of other orders do exist. Like the Kronecker Delta tensor, the Epsilon tensor has a special definition. This time, we define it as Epsilon I, J, K is equal to plus one, if i, j, and k are equal to 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2, minus 1, if i, j, and k are equal to 3, 2, 1, 1, 3, 2, or 2, 3, 1, and is equal to 0 otherwise. The epsilon symbol is plus 1 when i, j, k is found in the following list of numbers 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. and it is minus 1, when i, j, k can be found in 3, 2, 1, 3, 2. If we have, for example, 1, 1, 2 for i, j, and k, then the epsilon symbol is equal to 0, because we can't find it in either of the lists of numbers. Because it can equal plus or minus 1, we affectionately call the epsilon symbol the alternating tensor. Again, we look back to our alternate perception of tensors from the first episode. We describe a third-order tensor as a sort of hypermatrix, with 27 components. To make it easier to understand, we can lay out the components of this tensor as three normal matrices, each 3 by 3 in size. We can see from the definition that the alternating tensor has six components that are non-zero, with 21 being equal to zero. We lay out these matrices as follows. Epsilon i, j, k, for k is equal to 1, is this matrix here on the left. For k equals 2, is equal to this matrix in the middle. And for k equals 3, this matrix here on the right. Imagine laying these matrices together, like sheets of paper. That's what the epsilon symbol would look like as a hypermatrix, or, if you want to consider it, like a cube. For the purpose of this course, the hypermatrix representation isn't considered further, but may help some of you visualise how it works in 3D. Let's now go deeper into the properties of the alternating tensor. Like in the last video, take a few moments to think about why these properties hold. We'll discuss them further afterwards. The first property is epsilon i, j, k is equal to epsilon k, i, j, which is equal to epsilon j, k, i. The second property is epsilon i, j, k is equal to negative epsilon i, k, j, which is equal to negative epsilon k, j, i, which is equal to negative epsilon j, i, k. The third property is epsilon i, i, j is equal to epsilon i, j, i, which is equal to epsilon j, i, i which is equal to zero. Let's have a closer look at property one. We describe the way the indices change as a cycle because you take the last index and move it to the front of the list. This is similar to how we viewed the list of numbers in its definition. It may be easier to think of it in the way that we can say that epsilon i, j, k is the same as any epsilon with the indices found in the following string of letters. i, j, k, i, j. Now for property two. It does look a little strange, but it is effectively the same as the above, but in reverse. We take the epsilon symbol, epsilon i, j, k. If a second epsilon has a list of indices that is reversed to that of our original epsilon, that is to say, k, j, i, then it's the negative of our original epsilon. It may be easier for you to understand that we have the negative of our original epsilon if the second epsilon has indices in the string of letters k, j, i, k, j. Property 3 just builds upon the definition of an epsilon symbol. If two indices equal the same thing, or in this case, are the same thing, then the entire epsilon symbol is equal to zero. This is because epsilon i, j, k is only non-zero when i, j, and k have different values. If we have two instances of i, for example, then these two values will always be the same. This is because you have a repeated index. That's nearly all for episode 5. Before we wrap up, let's have a little recap of the content found in this video. Are you able to recognise an epsilon symbol? Can you define the epsilon symbol in terms of the relationship between i, j, and k? 
Can you understand how the epsilon symbol can be expressed as a hypermatrix? Can you name the three properties of the epsilon symbol and explain why they hold? That's it for today. A tough video will be coming your way in episode 7, so make sure you understand all of what we've covered in episodes 5 and 6, because episode 7 builds directly upon this. If you want more guidance before you step up to the next video, have a look at these links. That's all for today. Farewell.